Ed here with the Digital Digest, and today I wanted to share a comparison between the Panasonic ZS100 on the left and the Sony A6300 on the right. Now these are two very different cameras, but close in terms of pricing. You're looking at $700 US for the compact point-and-shoot, what I would call travel camera that the Lumix represents with a 25 to 200 millimeter uh, Leica lens based around a one inch 20 megapixel sensor, UHD video capture capability, a suitable EVF left mounted, a fixed LCD that is touch screen on the back of the camera, and a really robust feature set. Uh, on the other hand, we have the A6300, which is a mirrorless interchangeable lens camera with a larger sensor, an APS-C sensor at that, uh, so not full frame, but definitely getting close. Uh, this is the kit version, which is priced at $1150 US, so yes, there is a pretty big difference between 700 and 1150 but the body alone is 1000 and that's what I think will make this a compelling comparison for many consumers that are looking in that range at least in terms of budget in terms of overall performance. Now the first thing I want to say uh, right out of the gate is that of course because the A6300 has the larger sensor and interchangeable lens capability it is easily the better photographic tool, no question about it. But whether or not that makes it the better photographic tool for you as a user, uh, as a customer, as a professional, uh, a hobbyist, enthusiast, whatever you may be, is a completely different story. And that's the whole reason that I'm doing this comparison to begin with. Besides the fact that you're looking at, in my opinion, the two most uh, impressive cameras on the market right now, the most recently launched cameras, both coming out here in the month of March 2016, uh, this on the 25th in the U.S. and this on, uh, was it the 10th or the 11th? So both brand new products from two companies that really do push the envelope when it comes to digital imaging. Uh, so again, interchangeable lens camera with an APS-C sensor, one inch sensor with a fixed 25 to 200 millimeter sensor, they are different worlds. Uh, but when it comes to what they can do and the fact that their form factor is relatively close, yes, the Panasonic offering is definitely much more pocket friendly, whereas the A6300 could end up putting you into a gear bag if you have enough glass for it, even though it is fairly compact for its still and video uh, prowess. So something to keep in mind. Uh, but overall, both of these cameras are very, very good at what they do, whether we're talking about still or UHD video. It really comes down to a matter of convenience and whether or not you have any personal uh, preference for the menu systems. I would say Panasonic has a cleaner layout of the menu system than Sony does, even though, again, different classes of camera. Uh, both have built-in flash. Both have built-in EVF. The EVF on the A6300 kills the EVF uh, found on the Lumix, but the Lumix does have a touch screen that I know many consumers wish Sony would start to offer. On the other hand, the A6300 does have an articulating LCD display, even though no touch screen, whereas the Lumix has a fixed display on the back. So inferior uh, viewing, whether we're talking about EVF or LCD screen on the Panasonic, but again, the Panasonic, much less money and a single product solution for what arguably might push you to carrying around a bag with the A6300. Now this is the kit piece of glass, again, a 16 to 50 millimeter power zoom lens. It is an APS-C native E-mount piece of glass from Sony, not an expensive lens, and a, I would say a pretty good performer, at least when we talk about uh, the video capability that this camera is capable of. It's also capable of slow motion, 5X uh, slow-mo, 120 frame per second, 1080p, which is nice if you plan to go in a post and actually utilize that. You have a hot shoe on the top, something you're not getting uh, with the point-and-shoot fixed lens uh, Lumix, but that's a given. You know, it's really not meant to be that sort of camera. Even Sony's RX100 line ended up ditching uh, the hot shoe in favor of focusing on features that they believed would be relative or relevant to the consumer market. Uh, the Panasonic does have some great features, though. I mentioned the touchscreen, even though it is inferior uh, to what Sony has to offer here, much like so is the sensor and arguably the lens, depending on how much you want to spend on a lens for the A6300, as is the EVF. Uh, the value here is that you get that one-inch sensor that performs very well, combined with some very clean menus and great software and quick autofocus. Uh, both also have similar battery life. 
The autofocus here, I would say, is good. Of course, not as good as the A6300, which sets the new standard, basically, uh, for the digital imaging world in its class. Uh, but this is a point-and-shoot camera. I can't reiterate that enough. And in terms of the performance that I've seen so far, uh, UHD video, no overheating here. You will actually see some overheating with the more expensive A6300. Also, the touchscreen will allow you to deal with post-focus where you can actually take a picture and then touch the screen to decide what subject you actually wanted to focus on, something you cannot do with the Sony that requires post-processing if you can even pull it off. Another thing is 30 frames per second here in 4K, uh, which equates to 8 megapixel stills. You're not going to miss a moment if you can live with that quality rate. Here we have incredibly high uh, autofocus capability, 11 frames per second that's accurate, uh, as well as um, a much, I would say, better tracking system than the, its predecessor, the A6000, uh, with its high-density tracking system that Sony's employed with their copper wire-based uh, uh, sensor design here, uh, which does basically improve uh, low-light performance as well as just about everything else that the A6300 has to offer. Um, you also have uh, ports on here that you don't on the Panasonic, but again, it's a different class of camera. We actually do have a dedicated microphone uh, port as well as HDMI and Sony's Multi, which is really a micro USB port right here. On the Panasonic, you're just going to get the uh, micro USB for charging and HDMI out, nothing else. Uh, both, of course, shoot raw stills. Uh, the Sony does have uh, video profiles, S log for video grading that the Panasonic doesn't have, but again, different consumers in mind here, in my opinion, but inherently will draw the same consumers because of how close they are in proximity when it comes to pricing. Uh, personally, if you're looking to grow and the hobby is going to evolve for you, the A6300 is the easy choice to make because you're getting, I would say, a lot more because of that larger sensor. Um, no in-body stabilization here, though. Everything is lens-based, so whatever lens you buy will determine how stable your footage is going to be besides your own two hands. The Panasonic, on the other hand, is a point-and-shoot coming from Panny, has five-axis stabilization, which is a good thing. Both have sensors to detect whether or not you're using their respective EVFs. The Panasonic, again, makes things simpler by giving you one-touch access to turn that sensor on or off and make the camera dedicated EVF or LCD-based. Uh, while I wish this had an articulating screen, again, it's got the touch screen, and to me, um, in many ways, more important uh, post-processing elements built in than the A6300 with its slow motion capability uh, because for some users the 120 frames per second 1080p isn't really important. Uh, but the, the UHD video out of both is very good. Of course, with the A6300, it is better. Arguably, its Super 35 footage is some of the best in the business, close to its A7R Mark II uh, sibling, which is $3,200 instead of 1000 for the body. Uh, the build quality on the A6300, absolutely superior. Uh, the weatherproofing, also superior. But again, 700 versus 1150 for what you're looking at right here. And this lens is very limited at 16 to 50 as opposed to the 25 to 250, just as its size on the right limits its capability as far as where it's going to go, even though when I compare it to something like the A7R Mark II, the A6300 looks like a gumdrop. So ultimately, it comes down to how much you're seeking out in terms of convenience. Um, I'm saying that with inexpensive glass, the A6300 and the brand new Lumix are a lot closer than you might think. Uh, but with high quality E-mount native glass, the 6300 becomes a completely different imaging beast. Um, of course, ergonomics are better here. You have a legitimate grip. You have more programmable and customizable buttons, but the menu system more convoluted. So there are drawbacks, no touchscreen, no self uh, portrait mode with this LCD, but then again, the Panasonic is completely fixed and has an inferior uh, EVF to boot. And one of the things I love the most about the A6300 is its EVF. It's really best in class right now for its price, form factor, and in the mirrorless uh, interchangeable lens world, and arguably in the entire uh, digital imaging world. It's right up there with what the A7R Mark II uh, you know, delivers with its frame rate and wide, uh, wide field of view, something that makes you feel like you aren't using an EVF, which is so important in a world of cameras where, you know, for the most part, the EVF tends to be a limiting factor rather than a feature. So this really comes down to, 
As always, budget first and what you plan to do with the camera. If you want to travel all in one solution, this is your winner. If you want a camera that you know is great and that you actually do have the interest to possibly buy lenses down the road for, go with the 6300. You know, so if your budget stops at the 700, you're not going to be disappointed with what uh, the brand new Lumix uh, has to offer because the ZS100 really has so much more than anything else out there for the price. In fact, there's nothing really to directly compare it to. Even the RX100 Mark IV is not really a solid direct comparison because of the difference in focal range. Um, you know, form factor and pricing, yes. Uh, but if you are willing to entertain the idea of getting other lenses, um, E-mount native lenses, you don't have to go full frame, that are, you know, high quality, like the 18 to 105 F4, $600, yes, it's a very big add-on for this camera, but it's going to change the way and uh, that you do things and what you can actually do with uh, the A6300 uh, that you inherently are limited, of course, by the fixed lens attached that like a piece of glass, that F28 to 5.9, a variable aperture lens, where with the A6300, you have a multitude of prime glass. You can even use legacy glass from any manufacturer with an adapter. Uh, so a lot more flexibility, but that's what makes them very different cameras. Again, the pricing and form factor is what I think will lure uh, consumers to look at both, and also the fact that they're two of the latest and greatest offerings in the DI world. So I like them both a lot. I could see these easily complementing one another in a gear bag and being the only two cameras that someone owns. I can also see either one of them being the only camera that someone owns, which is why I have them here to share with all of you today. Uh, but if autofocus, overall image quality, uh, is your primary, uh, then the A6300, hands down, is the winner. If you want an all-in-one package where you're never going to pick up anything else, then it's really tough to beat the Lumix right now. I mean, the ZS100, again, just has more than anything else we've seen in a compact point-and-shoot camera, and that includes the RX100 Mark IV, even though it has a better viewfinder, better LCD, fully articulating um, it doesn't have a touch screen, you know, it doesn't have the length of the lens that this does, if that's what you're after. And if versatility is your goal, uh, and is in a, as much of a zero compromise environment as possible, which is what both of these small form factor cameras are about, even though they are very different, again, uh, the Panasonic is clearly uh, the best offering we've ever seen with that goal in mind. So, I love both of these cameras so far, uh, I can't really, well, find too many negative things to say about them. I don't think you'll be disappointed with either one. It really comes down to whether or not you're looking to grow or, you know, you simply want something that you're going to run and gun with all the time and wait until the next latest and greatest camera rolls out. The A6300, on the other hand, is the next latest and greatest as long as you've got the budget to accommodate some quality glass for it. Uh, that is, if you don't need uh, all of the qualities um, that full frame bring, you know, full frame uh, lenses and camera sensors bring to the table like the A7R Mark II. Uh, any questions or comments, please feel free to post them, hit that like button, and as usual, please subscribe. Later.